So thank you for coming. Um, I'm Allison Peters and I'm the director of exhibitions here at the Hyde Park Art Center. And um, today's talk, as you probably know, is um, titled Diasporic Vertigo, a conversation between Valerie Thomas, Kendia Alvarez, and Colleen Smith. And this is actually held in conjunction with the closing of Candida's show and the opening of Colleen's show, which um, are at the Hyper Art Center, if you didn't catch that already. Uh, we're in Candida's show right now, and Colleen has done a site-specific piece in the hallway um, that opened a couple weeks ago. The reception will be April 14th. And, um, and she also has a, a, another part of the exhibition, which is um, by the Washington Incubator from the University of Chicago, which is 118 South Garfield. Is that where the piece is? Yeah, yeah, Garfield and Indiana, South Indiana. Yeah. Just on the other side of Garfield. So um, part, of her, um, part of her installation has a map. We also have a map at the front desk that uh, we encourage you to use a bike tour map and go see that piece where you can walk it. Maybe in the daytime. In the daytime. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about, about our um, esteemed guest, Valerie Thomas. Uh, author and cultural scholar Valerie Thomas will discuss the concept of diasporic vertigo and its relationship to the artwork of uh, Candida and Colleen. Um, Thomas coined the phrase diasporic vertigo to define a new transgenre movement in African diasporal arts, which she describes as an aesthetic rooted in the experience of black bodies in diasporic space, and a methodology that acknowledges the historical trauma of enslavement, colonization, and genocide, but invokes the ancestral spiritual principles associated with the crossroads as sacred transformative space, if you can't call that. We're gonna um, be able to unpack that a little bit more, and that's why I'm really excited to have Valerie here. Um, Valerie is an associate professor of English and Africana studies at Pomona College in um, Claremont, California, where she teaches literature and social justice. Um, her writing has been included in uh, Black Cool, edited by Rebecca Walker in 2012, which uh, Dawood Bay also contributed to, and there are many other <laughs> great scholars. Um, and she is currently writing a book on um, indigenous spirituality and sacred space of African national film and literature. Um, other research interests of hers include African American literature, black feminism, uh, feminism, plural, and uh, Afrofuturism. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of overspill between um, Colleen and Candida, and that's why it was really important that we got Valerie here um, via the channel with Candida and her, her other relationships. Um, uh, and also, Valerie has uh, written a catalog essay. For uh, Candida's catalog, which is going to be due out the fall, um, so keep keep we'll keep you posted. And um, the essay is called "Live from Mongo Mountain," and um, it's a really great read. So I, I really um, hope you guys will check back in and find that book when it's done. Um, so a little bit about Candida and Colleen, if you don't know them already. Um, Candida was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, um, but has been living in Chicago for nearly 10 years, if not more? 17. 17. <laughs> All right, we'll call her Chicago Um She's got a BA from Fordham University and an MFA from Yale, and um, she's done several artist in residence um, programs at Skowhegan, PS1, Pulchunk, um, McDowell Colony, and the Studio Museum Harlem. Um, where she's also in the collection of the Studio Museum and uh, the Whitney and the uh, El Museo del Barrio. Uh, she's been reviewed by Art America, Art News, and the New York Times. And just recently, this show was reviewed in Art 21, so um, you should take a look at that if you haven't seen it already. And um, Kenya's actually taught at the School of the Art Institute since 1998, and she's a tenured professor in the painting and drawing department there. So she's been part of the um, Chicago Art Ecology for quite some time, and so we are very, very excited to have this show of her most recent work. Um, and Colleen, uh, Colleen's been in Chicago only a couple of years now, right? 2000, 2011-ish. <laughs> um, and she's a West Coaster, grew up in Sacramento, that her and Valerie have that in common. Um, and. Uh, Colleen's done residencies at Three Wall, the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, and the Experimental Sound Studio, which is what actually brought you to Chicago, right? Yeah. 
um, and hopefully we'll keep her for a little bit longer. <laughs> um, she's got a BA from San Francisco State University and an MFA from UCLA's School of Theater, Television, and Film. Um, her work has been shown in a variety of spaces, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, which many of you might have seen last year, um, the Kitchen near the Buena Center for the Arts, uh, LACMA Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, um, and the Nelson Ackerman Museum of Art in Kansas City. Um, Colleen is also currently the um, Arts and Public Life Center for Study of Race, Politics, and Culture Artists in Residence at the University of Chicago. Um, and I already explained to, to you a little bit about that. I mean, how long are you in our center? It's until September. Until September. So, um, also, keep checking in because I think uh, we were interested you today and there's some great stuff in there and it'll only continue to get better. Uh, so enough of me talking to you about all this stuff. We're going to start talking um, about the topic and I know um, I've had some words with these powerhouse ladies on this panel and um, what we're going to do is have a, a conversation style. Uh, hopefully uh, Colleen can ask, we'll ask Candida questions, Candida will ask Valerie questions, we'll all kind of participate in this discussion, and then um, I guess feel free to jump in, raise your hand if there's something that you want to contribute or um, ask, but we'll, we'll probably talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up too at that point, um, if the format doesn't go that way already. So um, first of all, uh, I'll start with Valerie. Um, <laughs> so uh, if Valerie could tell us a little bit about um, the diasporic vertical concept and um, maybe how you see it as a framework that um, can bring up new ways of looking at the work of Colleen and Candida too. Okay, I hope so. Should I use my or can you hear me? Okay, we're recording, so I guess I'm speak into a mic. Um, so thank you. I, I, and before I start talking about the thing, about the vertigo idea, I just want to express my gratitude and I'm really so happy to be here and it's been a wonderful visit. So thank you to the Hyde Park Art Center and to Candida and, and Allison and, uh, and Colleen for coming and allowing me to talk about your work here. Um, it's been a great trip and it's kind of a homecoming for me because I have most of my family from the south side of Chicago. I was born in California. So this is lets me come back to their stomping grounds and it's very wonderful to be able to come back here and be doing this um, on this trip. So um, I, I think I probably should start by talking about what my idea on vertigo is not. It is not Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> People usually think, oh, that movie. And so I, I, I want to say hello to the movie and then move on. <laughs> Thank you, Alfred Hitchcock. But my point there is that um, it doesn't really explain all there is to say about vertigo. It doesn't really explain the whole concept. And I'm interested in finding some ways to contextualize it and historicize it and look for it in other places and find other meanings than um, Freud and a particular kind of sexuality and gendering and also um, pathology. I want to move it away from pathology because there's so much work that celebrates it. There's so much work around. I, I come to it from literature. My background is kind of in literature and film. And so I started recognizing it really in um, works by people like Ralph Ellison and Toni Morrison and um, um, even all the way back to like Frederick Douglass and Phyllis Wheatley. Um, these, these moments in which there's a kind of like disequilibrium or a kind of um, preoccupation with um, fragmentation, with dissolution, with a moment of suspension or a moment of like flight that Ellison describes as like, you know, you take flight and then you go into the jazz solo and it's completely winging it. It's the moment of improvisation and possibility. And then I started realizing that there's a lot of artists who really want to call attention or who are really impacted by thinking about that. And so that's where that idea of vertigo comes from. And it also comes from wanting to think about what it is to be like a body that experience in a body, you know, or to occupy a body that experiences dislocation. And I grew up in um, California, like I said, 
being a black woman. And I have a lot of moments of dislocation, cultural dislocation, social dislocation, <laughs> moments of dissonance. And um, it's very frequently interpreted outwardly by, within this frame of you know, something pathological or something wrong or something like being like, um, you know, somehow like not synced up to the way things are supposed to be. So for me, the connection is really kind of personal, is, is trying to sort out visceral responses and sort out emotional responses. And what I find is that in many of the, the, the films, the, the fiction, the poetry, the music, it's amazing that it goes across so many genres and across so many time periods and even across languages. So we can be looking at a movie you know, like Yaelene from Mali. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, or we could be looking at Daughters of the Dust, or we could be looking at To Sleep With Anger. We could be looking at Tales from the Hood. Um, we could be looking at, you know, um, Ornette Coleman. We could be, or, or listening. <laughs> Interesting thing with these Vertigo projects is that they want you to sort of like hear and see and, you know, and explore all the senses at the same time, play with that. Or we could be looking at work like this. Um, I find Candida's work, I was very attracted when we got talking to her, talking about her work in, in terms of quarreling and dissolution and um, breaking things down and pushing through things and reconstructing. And so that it just like sort of like, you know, it sounded that note for me of like, I mean, there might be some vertigo things going on here. But in a lot of the work, um, either consciously or, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, the idea of um, crossing into a kind of like threshold space or a crossroad space, as I kind of see it, um, is being invoked. Sometimes it's being invoked like in direct connection to um, ancestral traditions and to thinking about uh, things like the trickster and like West African culture and issue and, and, and other times it's sort of just playing with a kind of more general idea. Um, but I have been trying to locate places where, you know, there's a way into thinking about what principles are there. So I also want to say that I am attempting, what I'm trying to do in, in this work is not only to notice it as like a kind of object, like, oh, it's there, how cute, but also to think about what are the critical principles to draw from this, like, and can it be a methodology? Like, does it make me ask certain questions? And are those questions, like, useful to ask? And are they telling me something that I wouldn't get otherwise? And are they taking me to, to information I wouldn't have otherwise? Um, and so Allison has been really helpful as a person to, to talk to and, um, you know, to get me thinking about these ideas and one of the questions that she asked was, well, what are those things? You know, what are the qualities or what are the questions? And so I'm thinking about that. I want to share a few with you. I, my feelings that the questions are embedded most of the time in the work. Um, and, and they might be asking things like, what is it, you know, what is that moment where you suddenly find yourself a little bit off the beat, right? Or having to improvise. It a lot of times goes back to vernacular, so I'm asking like, where's the vernacular thread in this? You know, where's that vernacular like like knowledge or wisdom in it? Like, you know, what does it mean when I return to that thing that they used to say in my family about making a way out of no way? Um, what does that really mean? And, and and so the other thing I want to say about about that particular thing is that it is a way into asking questions about emptiness, which is I think the larger issue. Is is it's a way into asking questions about a different kind of aesthetics with Clyde Taylor. It was a wonderful book, and I'm in his army now. Um, he has this book out called The Mask of Art. So if you haven't seen that book, I really, I'm just like, it's, <laughs> it's called Breaking the Aesthetic Contract. And in it, he talks about um, moving away from a Eurocentric aesthetic um, system and assumptions which have historically, he wants to historicize it, he wants to say that it has served um, a particular kind of liberal bourgeois agenda about like, identity and individualism and, and capitalism. And he's posing the, the possibility of coming up with a sort of like uh, broken aesthetic that, that is a little bit more self, what he calls self-authenticating. 
So when I think about that, and I think about like spaces of emptiness, spaces of um, kind of a void, which have historically in Europe been taken, been, 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 been figured as uh, spaces of lack, spaces that lack things like hierarchy, spaces that lack meaning because there might not be any perceivable sort of like um, action going on in them or perceivable sort of like uh, activity or a particular structure or order. Um, I, don't, I think that vertigo and in the way that it's being handled in, the, in these works, um, that they're suggesting it holds the possibility for being seen as uh, meaningful or that the experiences that come out of it can be meaningful. And I would ally it to things like uh, the sort of uh, Buddhist or you know, Hindu contemplations of emptiness and what emptiness can mean. So I, I talk for a long time because I'm trying to just lay the whole thing out in, 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 you know, in a little bit. Yeah. But my... No, that's good. <laughs> you, what? Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be a moderator here, so I'll, uh, what do you guys think about uh, what, I, I saw you kind of jumping up and down for me. <laughs> and I have some research to do, and that was 20 minutes, so. Um, and you have to understand that we literally just spent two hours together talking nonstop, and she just laid down, like, you know, a whole new sort of, like, um, I guess, volume of uh, discourse. So, um, the things I got super excited about was, okay, vertigo, we started with that. Um, this idea of it being linked to the Freud and pathology, and that's where it lies with Hitchcock, but there's more. And uh, it made me think of um, a recent obsession I have. I'm this, this person who just sort of leaps from one obsession to another. Um, it was uh, Martin Luther King's speech about creative maladjustment. It's a speech that Martin Luther King would, gave. Uh, um, it was part of his sort of college circuit, um, and it, it, it's not a, a speech that became part of the civil rights canon. Um, I stumbled on it by accident. Are you familiar with this? It is. Uh, oh, good. I, I have some notes to give you this. But um, <laughs> creative maladjustment was um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s, uh, Dr. King's uh, proposal to young people, which was that maladjustment is a psychological term that describes individuals who cannot, um, cannot seem to fit in, behave, or um, sort of like interact in a way that's socially acceptable. They can't adjust to their surroundings and their environment, and they, they refuse to sort of comply with their environmental circumstances. And he was saying, and this is 1963 to 60, like, yeah, he's saying it, that um, it is entirely sort of like appropriate and reasonable state of being to be maladjusted. He was encouraging young people to embrace the notion of maladjustment as a response to the society in which they lived. It is just, it's a beautiful speech. He links it to agape and love. He links it to Aristotelian discourse. Um, but it's a charge, and he's giving a speech, mind you, at, at, um, at white colleges and white universities, which is why it didn't end up in the civil rights canon. Um, and he would go to college or college and say, I invite you to join the Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. Mm -hmm. And so rather than like absorbing the pathology of it, he, would, he was encouraging people to consider like the, rationally the environment they're in and what is the appropriate response. So I just wanted to say that there is that amazing link to sort of um, um, removing from all of these concepts, or like actually not removing, but expanding these concepts that sort of were like calcified in the 50s to the point now that people don't even know that this notion of vertigo is linked to sexuality and Freud and all that, um, calcified and expand them so that they're more useful. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, that's huge. That's a whole I know, I got something for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the components that uh, you're going into is this kind of 
broken up uh, or disparate parts that get filtered in together. And I think that's something that both you guys, um, Candina and um, Colleen, do. And maybe you could talk about um, your sources and how you pick them and, and why you combine them or, um, or any version of that. It's a big question. Um, as you both, all three of you were talking, of course, my mind races and um, memory, you know, these sort of threads and um, relationships, um, so uh, they begin to come to the foreground and they commingle and, and in many ways it represents how I've been in practice, right? Um, um, and so um, the, the essay that really, one of the essays that really uh, made me think about all of this in such a different way was um, Stuart Hall's essay um, called Minimal Self. And um, I, think, I think that was written in the 80s uh, where he talks about um, you know being Guyanese and being in London and how everybody, all the black folks, I mean all the, all the sort of uh, the, the, um, uh, the um, what I call them, the, the pe you know, the people he grew up with and um, his, uh, all the so-called um, Londoners, black Londoners were like so excited about using the word black, you know, it's like the notion of immigrants and migrants, and migrations and all of that. I and mean, he started to like, I mean, it's a very complex essay, um, but, uh, but this idea that being, uh, being in this postmodern condition really meant that he was at the center, like he could understand that, um, um, that this was uh, for him uh, a, a, a wonderful moment, you know, the postmodern condition wasn't like sort of losing something, but it was kind of holding something. And uh, I, that was really interesting to me, you know, um, uh, and sort of to celebrate this, this the, frag the sort of the notion of fragmentation, the notion of being in many places simultaneously. Um, it's really, it's important to me. I remember when I was at Yale in the 90s thinking back and thinking, wow, you know, how do I continue being this artist? Like, what does it mean to bring things that matter to me to the foreground, you know? Is that what it means to, you know, to sort of, to be in creativity? And so, and why did that matter so much? You know, um, this idea of sort of bringing something with you. Um, because in many ways, it's. I'm always in the process of becoming, and so, um, so there was never some uh, this idea that it was fixed, that my that my sort of uh, uh, the, the the ideas of sort of my my visual templates were were singular, or um, uh, uh, you know this idea of sort of being consistent was always sort of in question for me. And what does that mean, you know, to be sort of in this space where things are always sort of changing and sort of dismantling and the word, you mentioned the word fragmentation. Well, when I, um, several years ago, uh, I started working with this idea of multiple panels because I really questioned this idea of the singular moment, like the singular canvas. Like, why does it have to be singular? One. And uh, there was a conversation that came up while I was at the Edison Gallery of American Art and uh, there was a residency there, um, and also uh, Daryl was there at the moment as well. So it was really, uh, it was an important time. Um, and so it made me really think about how paintings were constructed and how they would come together. And then at some point I started to think about them like communities, like, and also to find parallels with sort of the, the urban structure that I was uh, living in, you know, the, the building, the project the multiple stories. So this idea of fragmentation, the idea that something whole can come uh, to fruition as a result of the manipulation of parts. And that painting in itself could be a series of these um, uh, sort of units of examination. And there was a game of chance that was embedded in that because I would work on panels individually and then at some point they would sort of come together. And so this idea of the fragmented body, the extended body, the extended painting, um, was a, a framework that was very important for me. Um, and also, um, from there, I was very much engaged with the performing body. I, Ramon was just born, I was very, this my son over there. Um, uh, there was something about performing painting. Uh, 
so I became very interested in sort of this idea that, um, you know, praying, swaying, uh, uh, I, that's all I remember right now. It's really funny, you know, it's like you think you'll remember the titles to your paintings forever, and then you get <laughs> older, and you realize, well, I've made a lot of paintings, a lot of titles, but this idea, so I can't remember it all right now, and I'm tired, but, but this idea that, you know, there was, there was emotion, there was, there was a, a sort of a parallel to the way I can grab the paint. Um, it was very thin, it was oil on, on a white, you know, a gesso surface. There were wood panels, so I can be really strong, and also very simple, and so, um, so I remember that as a time, a very special time, and it was, they were all black and white, you know, so it was really sort of, you know, so the use of black color, I think people get kind of, I don't know, a little bit upset, the use of black, black or blackness, you know. So I did this whole, because um, everybody always thinks, not everybody, but you know, the conversations that I was sort of finding myself in, like, you know, why are they so dark? But for me, they were beautiful sort of a, a, a way to sort of be uh, more introspective and this idea of slowing time down because when you're in a dark space it's almost like you know the light turns on like that you're in the dark room and your eyes slowly adjust and so in that darkness there was a drawing usually and it was a black on black drawing so there was this this, this idea about the image coming very slowly um, so we push forward a few more years. Now we're in the night. Well, we just left the 90s, and then into the year 2000. 2004 was another very important year where I came across. I was reading the New York Times. I became really fascinated with the, uh, the uh, you know, they would have beautiful images, pictures, um, and. Uh, there was one of uh, uh, Iraqi soldiers uh, sort of uh, sitting in a stadium. And in the midst of them was this uh, man uh, who was waving to them. And there was something about that uh, image, I think it was 2004, so we were in the middle of all of that mess in the Middle East, um, that really called me. And, uh, and from there, all these paintings have evolved. Um, so I think for me what's really important is being in the world. I can't, my paintings are sort of a shredding, uh, a shredding down or a, a sort of um, a gathering that gets, you know, uh, reconstructed, uh, um, uh, uh, reshaped. Uh, but there's a dismantling that happens. So we talked last night about sort of uh, the body, the internal body of the structure becoming, you know, architecture and smile. <laughs> um, uh, and um, there was something about sort of having the support, the structure, uh, and then being able to tear it apart to become something else from the parts itself. So, uh, so always feeling liquid. I don't really, I feel like I have to uh, uh, un always undermine something, you know? Like I feel like when I get too close to naming something, I want to slip away. Like I just, I, I want to go post. I want to go post. <laughs> post this, this, this pork, right? <laughs> right? I don't know. There's something about, that's the artist in me. Like I know, I don't want to know really what it is, but I know there's something there for me. So it's always a question, you know, so. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you kept trying to say it. I was like, I was waiting for you to say something. Because I could you keep talking. so many things. I know. I was like, I, I, there's so we many We all say so many things. We can talk about the color black for a moment. Yes. Yeah. As a color, um, gray and black are like two of my favorite colors because they are colors and they, like, you know, you can't just throw on any two blacks, right? They clash because they are so distinct. And they also are so enveloping, um, so, uh, I think, welcoming. And um, I've, I've um, ever since, I don't know, being an undergrad at San Francisco State, and I got basically inducted into, like, this 
militant uh, African nationalist cult. Uh, I think it was a cult now that I'm a free person. Um, uh, where I had to read a lot of books, which I'm grateful for, but um, there was a lot of a semiotic um, discourse around language in this cult. And um, we had to read like Francis, Dr. Francis Quest Wellesley, who's a psychiatrist who takes Freud and then just, <laughs> she just messes it up. Like she just takes Freud and makes it black, basically. So, um, there's a joke in an Eddie Murphy film where um, he's talking about the pool table as a metaphor for the planet and why is the white ball going around pushing all the colored balls in and then waits and waits for the black ball. And so, well, that joke actually comes from one of Francis Cosmo's really important theories, which is just amazing. So, and that, and like, the fact that many of you would know that isn't strange at all. It was like part of the discourse in the 80s when I was coming up, you know what I mean? Um, anyway, so, uh, why did it, uh, black? So anyway, the word black, and you look it up in the English language, the English Oxford Dictionary and its definition, and you look up the word white, and every black kid has to do this, right? You have to do this. It's just like every black female artist has to make work about their hair. You have to do this. And um, you know what I mean? There's things you have to do. So I did that. And um, it's true. It's true. I put it here. I told you, it gets done. <laughs> uh, so I haven't done it yet. I haven't done the hair thing yet, but I'm working on it. 